So I'd like to um, throw it open for a little bit of uh, audience interaction with the panel. And I will ask the panel as we go along perhaps to make any um, comments that they want to do on the, um, on the other panelist members' uh, presentation so that we develop um, something of a debate uh, going forward here. Um, so as you ask a question, and please be brief, um, if you can give your name and if you're an affiliation, if you have any, you can be anonymous, but it always helps for people in the room to know uh, where you're um, coming from. And uh, please use the microphone. Thank you. Uh, we'll take uh, three questions to start. Uh, Jean-Luc Moret, Graduate Institute, Geneva. I have two questions, one for Isabel and one for Andrea. Isabel, thank you for your, your very uh, interesting and very wide uh, presentation about the, the global picture, basically. Don't you think that one of the ways to, uh, to bring equity back in the development agenda, as you were uh, proposing, would be to put, as Andy Sumner is nicely putting it, Genie back in the bottle and shift to the Palma Index? Uh, which is much more uh, useful in terms of policy instrument. And if I'm not wrong, I think this is what Joe Stiglitz is proposing for the next uh, MDGs. Uh, you know this Palma Index, which is OK. Uh, so I would like to have your opinion on that, because we all continue to use the Gini, but it's not very useful in terms of policy orientations, of setting policy goals, basically. How do you do? You, know, you bring the, the, the genie back from 0.42 to 0.38. What does it mean, basically? Whereas the Palma could be, uh, I would like to have your opinion on that. For Andrea, uh, well, uh, my good friend, I, 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 I appreciate uh, your, uh, your input in trying to bring a little more optimism in the very gloomy picture. Um, but uh, don't you think that there is a problem in, because of course, Latin America, you're showing that it is declining, but it's starting from very high, very, very high, basically. It was among the highest in the world. And so we are from 0.5 more than up above 0.5, and now we are back to 0.43, 0.45, well, above 0.4. Uh, as you know, I'm not a Latin American specialist, but more Southeast Asia. We're exactly the other trend, the, the reverse trend in Southeast Asia. Don't you think that there is a sort of world uh, equalizing trend, you know, uh, around just above 04? And if it is the case, because I've read you very well in the past or so, this is still too high. This is still too high, 04, in terms of, you know, bringing equity back in the... So, because if we take the Palma, 04 would be a Palma above 2 between two and three, most probably, in all of these countries. And as you know, Joe Stiglitz is proposing for the next MDG a Palma of one. That is that the one ten percent of the richest would not have more than the 40 percent poorest. I'd like to have your uh, comments on that. Okay, thank you. If I could take Wouter next, then I'll take Rolf. Uh, for Isabel, um, to what extent can the poverty agenda be, be taken independently from the inequality agenda? In other words, is it possible to have a real, uh, uh, you know, let's say human rights uh, uh, um, uh, kind of based strategy on social protection flow in the right sense, uh, independent of the power structure, independent of the tax structure, that we just only work on how there can be this distribution within public expenditure. Uh, the second question for Richard is, yes, it is indeed true that there are lots of uh, uh, proposals in order to change the unregulated uh, financial sector. One uh, recent uh, example is the FAT tax, the, the financial uh, activities tax that has been uh, proposed actually by the IMF as, a, as a uh, substitute for the financial transaction tax. I know that Mr. Michael Keane of the Fiscal Affairs Department in the IMF has in his drawer since two years, uh, let's say, a, uh, a proposal in order to do this financial activity tax, which is basically some sort of a value added tax for the financial sector. But it doesn't, and I have been tackling him then for, for about two years, but it doesn't come out of his drawer because of financial pressure. So, so what can be done? Rolf van Hoven from Institute of Social Studies in The Hague. Uh, three brief questions. My first question actually was to Andrea, but it was the same as Jean-Luc Marais on the regression towards the mean uh, in terms of inequality, that uh, Latin America is very high. It's going back, but it's still very high. And uh, I don't think the figures show that the trend will go really down to a world average or 0.4 or something like that. And uh, so I'd like to have your opinion on that. Uh, th then a question to Richard. Uh, you mentioned the first Prebis lecture, and in that you mentioned uh, actually what Prebis mentioned on North-South is still uh, valid today. Uh, 
I'd like to challenge you on that. Uh, we have seen uh, that uh, there's much more integration between the economies in the south of the north. Uh, most of the poor people in the world are not living anymore in the poor uh, developing countries. So don't we see any more actually a situation where part of the south is now living in the north, that we see much more an interconnectedness in the world which translates also to greater inequality between countries and that the actual classical north-south divide is actually uh, disappearing. Uh, and then on Isabel, I... Uh, uh, liked your presentation very much. In the end, you referred to the uh, post-2015 uh, agenda and you said inequality is back on the agenda. How strong is inequality back on the agenda? We see the high-level <coughs> panel, for example, last year blocked a uh, indicator of inequality. There was the personal intervention of Cameroon in the high-level panel. And also in the negotiations in New York, there are several countries which don't want to talk about inequality. Mm -hmm. So are you not a bit too optimistic that inequality is really back on the agenda? And uh, then the corollary question is, why is there not much more political upheaval in uh, many countries, we have seen a weak Occupy movement, but that has gone already. Uh, so how do you see that? Thanks. Uh, gentleman at the back, uh, could you tell us who you are, perhaps? Yeah, my name is Taro Boel. I work for Angtad. Uh, my question is to Professor Cornia. He, was, he taught me macroeconomics, and uh, I'm grateful for that. <laughs> um, my question is about um, the interplay between cultural aspects and national policies in Latin America. Because I presume that um, there is a level of inequality that may be accepted in Ecuador, for example, that is not accepted in uh, Chile. So how is this playing out in your regressions? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. I'm Irmgard Nübel. I'm working in the research department of the ILO. And I, I would like to, to uh, ask a question to Mr. Cornia. Um, you are. You are showing that, I mean, in Latin, many Latin American countries, you have the issue that you have already uh, screwed up um, education and attainment structure. That means you have normally higher shares of tertiary education than of upper secondary education, uh, meaning that um, the rich children would go, you know, they would attend secondary education and then continue to tertiary education. So. Um, it was then, of, and, and, and you have this low share of secondary education because the poor children would not come to that level. Now my question is, and that's, that's the, the, because you were raising the issue of you still have a problem at the tertiary education level. If you increase in enrollment of poor children in tertiary education level, that would then maybe mean that you have to reduce the share of the rich children. And I think there you, you will have a political economy problem. Uh, and I, I would be interested in this issue can be tackled with. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, panel, a very uh, good range of uh, questions. Um, people wanting to um, push you back into more pessimism uh, on one level. The preference maybe for the Palmer over the, uh, the genie. Uh, is inequality really in the post-2015 agenda? Um, and uh, what's the story around um, education? Can it actually work the, uh, the magic uh, bullet? And please, as we go along, uh, comment on the... Um, presentations and interventions by other um, panel members. So who wants to go first? I think um, Isabel. Thank you very much, Tony, and thank you very much, everybody, for the questions. Um, regarding the Parma Index, yes, of course, uh, there's something you don't know. Uh, before I joined ILO, actually, I was at Columbia University, and uh, together with other colleagues in Oxfam, and other institutions, we were actually sending letters and calling the high-level panel to do please include <laughs> inequality properly and the PAMA index. Um, so yes, um, unfortunately, uh, we were not heard. Um, but uh, yes, I do agree with you. Then you did actually a very important, uh, very interesting questions, and both of you linked to Rolf and Bauter. And, you know, up to one point, you know, the poverty and inequality agenda are linked, and um, up to one point, there is a new equity agenda. Well, it's all in the making, um, but it is there. And now, the, if we put things in perspective, if we count the 80s and 90s, when the poverty agenda came in the 1990s, you know, that was something to, 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 to welcome. 
because so far there was a complete link between any economic, and for the case, any public policy with the social impacts. So, of course, we all knew that it was imperfect. And yes, to focus the attention only on the poorest was not, you know, solution for development, but it was certainly welcome. And in the same note, uh, it is to welcome the, the World Bank talking about shared prosperity. It's better to focus on the 40% than not only on the 12%. <laughs> But of course, the perfect will be to focus in the 100% in, you know, development for all, which is at the end the United Nations, you know, the idea of paradigm and the basis of any social contract. It should be for everybody. Um, so from that point of view, there is a shaping agenda, and you find it since the 2000s at the beginning. And some areas are very consolidated, and you have results from all the UN, the for all, really. Uh, you know, has consolidated. Um, many countries have signed to it. You do have it in many UN declarations, and and countries, a number of countries are applying it. So yes, it is there. Now that it is not perfect, that it can be improved. I know that we all know that, but as we all know, you know, life is a struggle. So this is part why we are all here in our jobs and you know, uh, trying our best. Thank you, Richard. Um, Prebish, what was if he was here today? What would he what would he be telling us? Well, I guess he would still be calling political economy the way to go as the paradigm. In response to Ralph's question, I, I mean this comes up all the time about somehow the end of the North South divide. I guess. Um, I mean, my my and and in, in terms of the, some of the discussion we've had today, you know, I, once you take China, I mean, there has been an improvement in. I think the latest figures by Milanovic show show a slight improvement of income distribution worldwide, mm -hmm. uh, globally over the last maybe decade. I, he had a recent piece that I I saw briefly. I, you know, China and there's no doubt that China and certainly India, maybe India since 2000, have are the main fact. The growth, the rapid growth in China and India are the main factors still behind that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that even when you take, if you just take China out of the story, that the world has changed enough to say that this kind of dynamic is is over. Brazil's share of the of the world economy today is what it was in 19, early 1980s. Russia's obviously is a lower share of, of, of world income than it was in 1980. You, we wouldn't, I don't think we would, I, 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 China's an amazing story that c complicates, the glo complicates the global picture. But the basic structural weaknesses that is what North-South is ultimately, it's a structural story, it's not an income story. I mean, you know, Latin America's gone back in terms of its increased reliance, as, as um, uh, Andrea said, on commodity uh, exports. It's failed to kind of diversify its industrial base in a way that is, uh, at least I think, is a necessary part of sustained development. And I think those challenges remain at the heart of the development agenda. So, yes, there, I mean, I, I don't think, I don't, even, even the horror stories like Detroit, um, it's not, it's not the horror story that you see in most parts of the developing world. I mean, it's a shocking indictment of 25 years of failed neoliberalism in the North. But I don't think it's, I think to, set, to talk about the South in the North is a slight exaggeration in that sense. So I still think that, I still think that, pic, that picture that Prebish had in the early 1980s still has a lot of resonance. The big, the big difference that Prebish didn't see is the rise of finance. I think that wasn't in his story. And he didn't see the, he didn't see the way in which the rise of finance, and in particular the rise of of private debt could somehow counteract the tendencies towards secular stagnation that he saw in the 19 in the, in the early 1980s. He he didn't have that story in there, but mu much of his underlying dynamics, I guess, I think, are still quite relevant. Uh, and that I, I mean, I don't have a solution to the the rise of finance. What Simon Johnson and what Simon Johnson, the former chief economist of the IMF, calls the quiet coup, the capture of 
state institutions and state policies by financial interests, which has become a, I mean, is a problem. Of, I mean, the North loves to lecture developing countries on good governance, but the, the, the capture of corporate and financial interests of, of states in the North is a, is a quite shocking indictment of the state of um, political discourse in advanced countries. Uh, and, and, I mean, I don't think the financial transaction, it was no, I mean, it was a throwing, it was a throwing sand in the wheel story when it was first devised back in the early 1970s, the, fin where the, the financial tax story. I don't think it can ad begin to address the problem of banks that are too big to fail and, and are even bigger today than they were before the crisis. I don't think it can address the problems of shadow banking, which has become such a large part of the international financial system. Um, but but, but and, and I think the shocking thing is there's an interesting debate going on between Krugman and Bill Black. Um, you know, Krugman had a interesting piece defending Obama against the progressives in a interesting a bit silly piece really uh, defending Obama against the progressives the progressive left in America saying that he's done a lot more than 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 they than, than they think he have and one of the areas that he thinks they've done a lot more on is controlling finance and you know, using the Dobb Frank legislation as an example Bill Bill Black who himself was a regulator and is now I think at the University of Kansas, maybe, or Missouri, or somewhere. Um, I mean, real shows how little, A, how little Obama has done, how ineffective most of the Dodd-Frank legislation uh, is, but also, in fact, what is still on, what could be done by a progressive government that is still just using the tools that are already in place and are not being used. And, and, and obviously a lot of that is down to the lobbying power of the, of the financial sector. And that's not only true, I think, of, of Washington. It's also true of Brussels, where the amount spent in Brussels by financial, we have some numbers in this year's trade and development report. I mean, it's quite shocking. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty depressing. I don't have a, I, I think the financial, the lack of progress for the IMF to push a financial transaction tax is, is probably the least of the, indictments of a failure to regulate the financial system but it is I find it a shocking state of affairs I must say just on education because we meant to in interact with my sartorial friend at the end of the uh, at the end of the panel here um, I, I, I was struck by the fact that the two two countries where where inequality has not changed very much Mexico and Nicar and in the case of Nicaragua I think you said it's increased They'd actually shown all improvement in the education genie that you had in your in in your one of your last slides, and I just wonder when you see discrepancies between improvement in education but no improvement in equality, what what lessons you might take from that? Well, I mean, if uh, Marcelo Neri, I mean, the Brazilian minister who spoke in Helsinki one month ago, is right, and you know, he has a PhD in economics, is not is not the product of a uh, some political regime. I mean, is right. I mean, is uh, there seems to be a sort of a structure. So now there is. I mean, if you look at the, the data for, for uh, 11 countries, there is a sort of a slowdown in Gini in 2012. If you if you include Uruguay, the, the slowdown is less visible. If you take other measures like the side ratios, is even less visible. You know? In fact, uh, Cepal. Um, argues that there is uh, no slowdown. I say, what well, a little bit, it seems to be. So let, let us see. And uh, um, now, I, I, first of all, let me be quite honest. I don't think the Palma Index is particularly useful. Mm -hmm. And I refereed several articles since I work in this business uh, and basically saying, wh why would it be that for which uh, mo law of motion, uh, the, the share of the middle class should remain constant in, in uh, Burundi and Sweden? And it makes no sense because it doesn't explain why is that. Secondly, if we take the data for Latin America, we looked at in, uh, during the 80s and 90s, I mean, the share of the middle class was affected negatively, and during the periods of recovery was affected positively. So it's not true that it's completely stable. So the statistics of the Palma Index and the explanation of why the Palma Index is like that, I mean, I mean is the middle class uh, completely exempted from any loss or any gain? Why? 
because there is no explanation of that. Now, and then if you have that, do you have more, a better policy indication uh, on what to do? No, unfortunately, you have to engage in all these decompositions and they, they, they may be particularly unpleasant and, and not always easy to communicate politically. But this is where the nuts and bolts are. I mean, a, you want to know whether it's the uh, unskilled wages or the skilled wages or the transfers. I mean, even if you say Palma index uh, should go from, I don't know, uh, three to five, whatever. I mean, then what you do policy-wise, basically does not inform you anything. And if I can say, no, sorry, I shouldn't say that, about referring journals, I mean, for, for journals. I mean. So, so now on the convergence, I'm equally, equally unconvinced. I mean, there are, there are people saying that. And how, how can I argue on the basis of economic theory that the country with a huge land concentration, persisting land concentration, uh, specialized in the mining sector, which is, I mean, let's say Chile or Peru, will converge to the same level of inequality in of Sweden. I mean, it's totally against any economic theory, you know? So, so it would be, I mean, it's fascinating. And then, so, the, then, in addition, it's not entirely true that, um, that uh, uh, all the countries are converging, because if you go to West Africa, the countries are, remain at a low level of inequality. Because, I mean, so in, low, in Western Africa, I mean, uh, in Western Africa, where Taro comes from, basically uh, you have still semi-communal ownership of land. So b basically, if you are an institutional economist, you say it's nine, not true. And, uh, and because you can't explain it. So, so then if it happens, it's a sort of a statistical, uh, a statistical findings, but then you, you're unable to explain it. When, now, the, the, the one article I like to refer to says that in a world characterized by free trade and free finance, all countries will have the same distribution. Then it means that Latin American Latifundia disappear, and uh, this is uh, basically... Now, then the other point, Jean-Luc, is that uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, I've done a paper for Mihefes, uh, for, for the UNCTAD, in to, for the issue of 2012 on, on inequality. And basically, in Southeast Asia, there are a few countries where inequality is falling. South Korea, for instance, you know, South Korea, Malaysia, and then so it's not true either. And then as the stop, as the inequality rise in China continues, I mean, it's, it's fallen by one and a half points now. Uh, this is on unchecked un, uh, sources. This is what the Central Statistical Office says. There is no private survey that continues to say that. So if China continues to grow on the coast uh, and uh, in the way that it does, inequality will not drop. And so basically the way to history, institution, geography, and all that, I mean, it's too far to, to, to claim that there is conversion to anything. This is my own, my own view. Uh, uh, although it may sound interesting and like, Now, Taro asks, uh, what is the inequality of action? Because w one could argue that, okay, if you are in the US, I mean, uh, uh, using the concept developed by our gurus, uh, Professor Tony Atkinson, inequality aversion. Societies are different. I mean, the Americans uh, basically they say that the gene of 0 0.4 is fine. Perhaps it should be higher. So people they fight harder to climb the social ladders because we give them an equal opportunity, which they don't. You know. So so that that is uh, now in Latin America. I think that will depend on the political process. And then uh, my observation is that uh, at least I mean the country I know the best in Latin, in Latin America now is uh, before it was Chile, now it's Argentina. And uh, and I have long discussion with uh, Alfredo and uh, the Argentinians, and I, and I see a lot of uh, uh, discussion. I mean people they are not passively accepting uh, uh, level. Of, now there is a big fight, Alfredo tells me, on the controls of the means of communication, which are influencing public perceptions in, in this area. So my view is that uh, the, the, the Latinos, the, the Latino people, uh, particularly with an increase in education, I mean, uh, they will be continuously unhappy about this, the state of the art. And, 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 and I think that, that that is important because then people vote. And I, if, I, if I were to say what has driven, I mean, t take Italy, take Europe, what has been the main equalizing factor? Education. Education has been, in Italy there has been a very modest land reform, partial, and came in the after World War II. And the main factor which has increased education, I mean, uh, reduced inequality, now is rising again. Basically where uh, uh, compulsory, universally, and free education, first for the primary, then the second, and now up to 18 years of age. Because of what uh, she says, basically you are not taking, I mean, this is a reproducible capital, you know? So if you do a land reform, you take away his land, so you will resist. 
And uh, so you really need a highly repressive regime like Guatemala, where, where you know, when the Jesuits went there to promote uh, primary education among the children, they shot all the Jesuits because they understood that these people would have been thinking with their own head and would have revolted eventually. So that is, uh, now, if, uh, I think that you may have an argument because, um, now, the, the, if the government improves secondary education, then the children of the poor will take an entry, an entry examination, being uh, well better prepared than before. So some children of the rich who went to private schools may be left out. But perhaps uh, enrollment will increase. Now you say it didn't increase much, but it, it may increase. I mean, th think of, uh, I mean, Chile must be two generations away from Western Europe. Eh? So, so if, you, if, you, if you think the history of uh, enrollment in education, when I went to university and now, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, the numbers are totally different. So there might be, uh, again, uh, is, is a reproducible capital. And then you say, but then there will be too many graduates. Well, it depends how the technology will go. So it depends on, uh, so, but in the short term, I, you, I think it's quite plausible they may have. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to take the gentleman at the front there and the gentleman behind. So. If you would like to tell us who you are. Michael Hopkins. I used to work in this August or institution. Um, and done a few things since. Um, I'm surprised at the debate, so I have a comment and a question. Um, that uh, it seems a little bit sanitized, this debate. And normally the sanitized version will come from the UN, not from my August college colleague, uh, Andrea, who used to be radical. And leads me to my, my comment is that we didn't hear very much about the distribution of power and what's been happening in our societies. Why is it as it is? We heard about education, but not about the distribution of power and structure. Um, Richard mentioned it in his, in his comment. I apologize for not hearing his speech uh, earlier, um, but he started talking about structure and alluded to, to the finance. I guess UNCTAD is less important, unfortunately, these days than it was uh, in the Prebich era. Uh, so m perhaps you've got more liberty to talk about these things. But when I was a lad in this organization, we used to talk about structure and power. And I didn't hear very much about it today. And I'm a bit surprised that uh, Andrea is not jumping right into that particular area. Um, and my last comment to characterize that is that uh, uh, Richard mentioned uh, Obama. And I had this conversation with my wife continually, by the way, who was pro-Obama, and I was anti. Um, but you mentioned Obama and his difficulties with the financial institutions, but you didn't mention the Koch brothers. And I think that's symptomatic of what's going on in the world, that power is being concentrated in so few hands and not altogether to the common good. So I'd like to see anyway in the future if you could talk more about that. And uh, let me ask uh, Andrea, how come he's not talking about these things? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. My name is uh, Min Fu Li from uh, the Institute of International Labor and Social Security of China. Uh, I have a question about uh, the growth and the inequality. Because the gentleman uh, said that uh, Growth is not a solution for uh, quality and for, for the solution for inequality. I quite agree with that. But I think uh, uh, growth is the basis for the maneuver of policies for, for setting out uh, uh, equality policies. Since, for example, in my country, it, it, it's possible for us to the extension of social security coverage to all the people, especially in healthcare area. So I think uh, high growth is the basis for, for that uh, policy maneuver. So uh, high growth is uh, quite important to that. And uh, my question to uh, the gentleman there is that uh, we, now, uh, on the verge of uh, possible uh, third deep for the Eurozone area, many countries are 
on the verge of uh, economic recession again. So uh, do you think there is still a possibility for labor market ad adjustment, for, for example, for wage in increase in some uh, crisis hitting hit countries such as Greece, Portugal, and some other country because I think uh, for, for the government of these countries, they think it's almost impossible to increase wages. So the easy way for them to do is to cut employment, to cut patients, and to cut wages. So gentlemen, what is your recipe for their uh, solutions? We know that it's unfair for the workers to reduce wages and reduce mm. unemployment. But so, the immediate solution, I think the easy way is to cut wages and cut patients. So what is your suggestion for mm. them? Okay, so what are your recommendations? So back to the panel. And my question to the panel uh, will also be, if there is one policy for the audience to take away, particularly back to their own countries, what would that one policy to reduce inequality be? So, back to our panel, if you could be brief, but Mike is demanding um, that uh, you're uh, not radical enough. It's true. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't think there's any relationship between marginal and taking pro progressive positions necessarily, if my institution is anything to go by. Um, but I'll leave Andrea to ask the question of why he's ignoring the question of power. Um, on China, I mean, I, we, you know, as I said, I would recommend that you take a look at our trade and development report where we explicitly criticize the European uh, austerity uh, labor market flexibility uh, agenda. I mean, obviously, cutting wages is a self in, a, in a period of slow growth, cutting wages is a self-defeating strategy because ultimately the demand for what you produce comes from the wages that you pay to your workers. And, in, in, and we've been very consistent in UNCTAD in criticizing the wage slashing uh, um, strategy as a self-defeating self strategy. And as I said in my presentation, we do offer alternative uh, 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 policy agenda for well for developed countries in general, but particularly the eurozone because the eurozone is obviously um, at the heart of the problem, at the heart of the problem right now. I guess my my I mean my crude strat my crude policy is you know cont control finance properly, tame finance, liberate labour. Well, I think to Richard. Um a couple of things. Of course, there are many topics that, that have not been included, huh? and, and we could go on and on uh, because simply there are many aspects of it. But I think what is important, it is to see the evolution of the development agenda that is becoming more and more progressive. I mean, now the World Bank publishes on land reform. Okay, That was unthinkable two decades ago only. Um, whether they do it or not is another thing. Okay, and you, as it was mentioned here by the panel before, there is a difference between the discourse and the, the policy action in the, at the country level. But it's still, you know, it's an opening and it is about moving that forward. And I don't think there is one policy that, for which you can generate more equality. And I think, the, the thing, from my perspective, what is critical to understand is a set of policies and you need to tackle different, you know, sectors and macroeconomic policies at the same time, otherwise it's not going to work in the long term. Thank okay, you. Thank you, Isabel. Back to the package that Richard emphasized earlier. We'll tweet about that point later. Okay, Andrea, briefly. No. We're not as powerful radical as we were once we were lads in short trousers. <laughs> no, no, first of all, we, we did talk about that. I mean, we did, we did talk about the changes in political regimes which have occurred, but uh, you, you, you had no time to arrive before. Now, but we also emphasize that uh, there has been no, even the center-left regimes, which um, with one or two exceptions, uh, basically it could be characterized as sort of like Latin America goes to social democratic Europe. That, that is the road, you know. So no land redistribution no uh, sort of nationalization of some strategic assets, uh, uh, only Morales. And so I think that uh, now, and then I've been discussing what this should, I mean, what has happened, and saying that perhaps they should have done more. 
And uh, I think that uh, in what we said is that they reduce inequality in 10 years, uh, the, all the increase in inequality of the prior 20 years, but they haven't tackled the, the, the structural issue, which is, uh, and which is a structural issue, distribution of assets, all assets, education, uh, credit, uh, land, uh, and uh, everything else. Now, in general terms, I think that if I uh, remove myself from the current situation, and I agree with uh, Richard, I think that uh, and we, 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 there is a new monster we are unable to control, which is finance. You know? So now, for instance, uh, the, the Renzi government is discussing in Italy to do this, that, and the other, and in one week, 65 billion euros just left the Italian banks. You know? So, I mean, how, how nice is that? So, but if you, if you are, if we assume that we are able to do that, and I think we will, there will be another 1929, you know, and then after that there will be another Glass and Steagall. Then I would say that longer term growth, I mean, if you want to have an equalizing solution, I mean, uh, I think that uh, basically equalizes the access to assets. That is the point. <coughs> Okay, thank you very much, Andrea. So we've run out of time. Apologies if you couldn't um, ask a question or make a, a comment. Um, it remains for me to thank uh, you, the audience, very much for participating today, to thank our excellent uh, um, panel, um, Isabel from ILO, uh, which also um, hosted um, the meeting um, today, uh, Richard from uh, UNCTAD, and Andrea from uh, the University of Florence. Uh, do join us on our respective um, websites. Uh, do follow us on uh, Twitter. And uh, we thank you very much. And it is still a gloriously sunny day in Geneva. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.